Hello everyone, this is Bobbin Threadbear, and welcome back to the crew too. Uh, and I'm Great Joe, and um... Well, there's traffic. I'm glad there's traffic. It's always fun. Yep. You may have noticed that we started right in the middle of a race. That is because this is the race. The New York to San Francisco race. Oh. Oh boy. I'm hyped. And as such... Now you got run to run. We are going to be here doing this particular race for the entire video. Alright. I figured I'd cut out any of the incidental stuff at the beginning as a result. <laughs> We're already going to be over half an hour here. Okay. So the world record time for this race is 24 minutes. Fantastic. That is the best anybody could do in some of the fastest cars that this game has to offer. All right. And incidentally, the uh, line between New York and San Francisco is not straight in this race. You may have noticed, in fact, that we just left one highway and we're going on to another smaller highway. I assume that's not true to life. Well, if you're asking if there's an interstate that can get you from New York to San Francisco, I'm not sure if it's necessarily the same one, but you can stay on the interstates the entire way across. No, even on the game's map, we are intentionally taking a circuitous route. The, the, uh... We are, we are taking the, um... Scenic route. And at the moment, we're actually just sort of running through the Appalachian Mountains. there's a video game over there. Hmm. You know, a fun fact about the Appalachian Mountains is that they are not on top of any fault lines. They were, uh, oh. they used to be a long time ago, but um, that fault line disappeared, fault lines reappeared elsewhere as, as happens with uh, the, the way the planet's tectonic plates move around. And as such, the uh, Appalachian Mountains have been dissolving and falling for millions of years. Oh. Huh. And I almost missed this turn. See, this... Oh, just almost. Yeah. This is the kind of race where having a navigator really comes in handy because I need to concentrate on the road, but I also need to you know, check where the hell I'm going. And, you know, but I turned off the navigation strip for reasons, because I'm used to trying to pull double duty on my own. Um, for me, it's kind of part of the challenge. Uh, I kind of wish they'd ju just do, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, root notes? Uh, having a somebody in the passenger seat reading out a um, turns straightaway links, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that that is essentially the navigator's job for long distance races like this in real life. And incidentally, this is going to be the last video of the Crew 2. Oh. Now, I considered showing you guys the head-to-head uh, -head multiplayer of the game, and in fact, I recorded some footage from that. But ultimately, I've decided against actually making a video about it. 
because what makes multiplayer in this game unique, the PvP multiplayer, is that um, I am fairly terrible compared to the people who've played hundreds of hours of this game by this point. And apparently not enough people are using PvP because I keep getting matched up against them and losing horribly on races that you guys have basically already seen before because virtually all of the uh, races that you can play at any one time in this game... Oh, crap. That was the turn. Alright. Ah, there goes Glenn. And Wayne. There's still plenty of highway. Yeah. You're only 15% of the way through. <laughs> I hopped right on over him. Anyway. So, yeah. Um, I get the feeling that the PvP makes an effort to match people against uh, similar skill levels or rankings at the very least. But uh, there aren't enough people playing it and so they you just get forced into the session with the uh, actually skilled people who also need someone to play against. Oh, that's a, that's a pickle. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the real kicker, though, is that if you actually want to rank up, you need to get at least second place in those races. So if you're up against two silvers or golds, then you are permanently stuck at bronze. Yeah. Aside from that and waiting in lobbies, there's really nothing to see about the PvP in the game. It's racing game PvP. You're either getting left behind or you're sticking in front of someone who's 20 minutes behind you. Yeah. Oh, hey. Looks like we're headed for uh, St. Louis. That archway there, it's called the Gateway Arch. Okay. Know why they call St. Louis the Gateway? And do you go through it? No, no, it's not the kind of gateway that you actually go through. It's, it's just a monument, an arch. But for a while, St. Louis was considered the Gateway to the West. It was the most centrally placed city on the east side of the Mississippi River. And so people would basically go there to pick up supplies that would take them further west into the new settlements in Oregon, California, and later on uh, Colorado and Utah. I assume these hopefuls would be traveling us along some kind of trail why, yes. In fact, there was a trail. There were several, in fact. <laughs> but uh, you may have noticed that when we hit St. Louis, we made a sharp right turn, and now we're heading north. Okay. We're heading north to Chicago. That's that city in the distance. Of course, they aren't within uh, spitting distance in real life, but uh, here everything's concentrated in one spot. So, I recently went through all of Need for Speed the Run, which features all well, the Cannibal Run from San Fran to New York. And the route, and that one as well, takes takes you through uh, Chicago as well as oh, oh takes you through uh, Chicago on the right way to New York. But there's no St. Louis. There's it's literally just a nondescript autumn valley 
What, Chicago or St. Louis? Between uh, between Chicago and New York, they just uh, cut St. Louis off in that game. Apparently they cut off the Appalachian Mountains if it's just a valley. Oh yeah, there's no Appalachian Mountains. Uh, the uh, route in that game takes you through the Rockies? And, no, not the Rockies, sorry. The, um, the Aspen mountain range. Aspen, Colorado? That is part of the Rockies. Yeah. Alright. Ah, crap. Almost missed another turn. <laughs> yeah. But fortunately, the guy in front of me missed the turn, too. <laughs> Saw him crash off to the right there. Sometimes. But yeah, we never enter Chicago proper here. We're just sort of flying through the highways of the... Oh, crap. <laughs> and birch trees. Yeah, we're just flying through the Chicago suburbs, and now we're back out on the road, heading west again. Ah. And by heading to Chicago and then west, we will be heading straight into the Rocky Mountains. Oh, hey, look. It's the uh, nuclear power plant. The one and only. Fun fact, that one never exploded. Unlike certain other nuclear reactors I can mention. Most... Most don't. <laughs> the safety record on nuclear power plants is uh, surprisingly good. Well, it's sort of like airplanes. Oh, yeah. Nobody talks about the airplanes that made it. Even though there are far <laughs> more of them. Exactly. There's the Rockies in the distance. You can see them now. Nice. Because we've basically just screamed through what little of South Dakota is in this uh, game. That little being Mount Rushmore. Pretty much the rest of the Great Plains are non-existent and we're turning right here just before Pike's Peak you saw the uh, saw the satellite dishes in the distance there uh oh so we're cutting those off yeah uh, Pike's Peak is actually on the uh, east edge of the Rocky Mountain range and just a bit south of uh, Denver which itself is just sort of sat right up against the uh, massive wall of mountains that starts about midway through Colorado. Huh. By the way, the vehicle we are driving here is currently the most expensive in the game. It's a Bugatti. And a common common recipient of the Italian tune-up, I believe it's called, as well as victim to uh, speed traps, speed humps. <laughs> well, if you're uh, rich enough to own one, you're rich enough to pay tickets. Yeah, it's just, uh, they c tend to get stuck on speed humps, is the thing. Ah, that kind of stuck. So right now we are on the interstates that go through the Rocky Mountains, and as you can see, sometimes that means literally through. And here's where you can really see the money that goes into the interstates, because we don't give a shit about terrain here. Wow. We're just going to build straight lines no matter what the ground beneath says we should do. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that always strikes me about American Rose is just how much of it is elevated. <sighs> stretches and stretches of elevated roads. Yeah. Put a lot of money into our road system here. 
kind of have to since all the commerce and people use them. Yeah. There's, there's Wayne right behind you. Yep. Yeah, just look at the road design there for the exits on the uh, mini-map on the lower right. Oh yeah, there's complex roundabouts and everything. Yeah. I mean, of course, none of this is like literally designed on any real roads, but they are indicative in many cases. here. We're not going to be staying on the elevated interstates for the entire run through the Rockies here, however. Okay. In fact, it looks like our turnoff is just about coming up. Nope. So... Oh! Yep, that, that's, uh, that's happening. That sure is happening. We're leaving the interstate, and now we are back down to the U.S. routes. And that's just... just roads. Yep, they are government, uh, federally funded roads. So they are relatively high quality, but they go through the road system already established. And you can see the interstate just cutting a straight line ahead, and... Then just look at the road ahead of us here, down on the ground with the, uh, plebeians. I mean, that's where roads should be. <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> well, and, uh... By the way, do you have any toll roads in Iceland? I don't suppose you would. Uh, there's, uh... There are tunnels, which are, uh, like, half state-funded and half just funded by selling toll rights to the contractor, I guess? Hmm. The most famous one, I guess, would be, uh, Kvalfjörgöngin, which cuts off an entire hour's drive around a fjord. Hmm. And it's it's really convenient, but it's also cutting off the most beautiful part of the journey from Reykjavik to the rest of the country, in my opinion. Yeah, well, sometimes people are in too much of a hurry to appreciate the scenery. You've got, uh, you know, um, a cargo full of fish that kind of needs to be there on time, for instance. <laughs> uh, that fjord used to be a sub pen hmm. for the Americans back in World War II. Oh, it's raining now. Oh, great. And it was getting so bright too, but now the uh, now the clouds have covered up the sun. And uh, welcome to Salt Lake City. Oh, yep, we've made it to Utah. Already here. And over here, we have Salt Lake to our right. So, thanks to the process of dissolving minerals and evaporation, Salt Lake is hazardous to most life forms. Well, it is so saline that almost nothing can grow in there. I'm guessing there's probably, like, extremophiles, right? There might be. I would need to look that up to find out. 
but it's sort of like the Dead Sea over eh, in the Israel region. I love reading about the Dead Sea. Apparently you could just float on it without like having to uh, adjust your buoyancy. Yeah, that's because the density of the minerals in the water is higher than the density of the uh, the chemicals in the human body. Anyway, now that we're out of Salt Lake City and past the Salt Lake, we've reached the deserts. And that there is Las Vegas. And it's raining. It does rain occasionally in the desert. Yeah. That's how anything is allowed to live there in the first place. I just think it looks neat. I like the... I guess uh, the look of patches of sunlight peeking behind the clouds. Yeah. That's nice. That is a nice effect. But you can see here that the roads are very straight and wide out in the desert. Because there's really no uh, need to make them curved out here. Mm hmm. Like, that's, for instance, why street racing is more popular in western states and areas like California, uh, areas like Los Angeles in California, where the neighboring area in includes a lot of deserts. Oh. I believe that we are going to be cutting past the strip rather than driving along it here. Assuming we haven't already. Because the strip is a, a north south road, and we're heading west straight through Las Vegas. Alright. Gotta love these city uh, highway connections here. Here you are. And already we are heading out of the desert and into the Sierras. The Sierra Nevada, in fact, because this is the Nevada side. Yeah. I, uh, getting back to just the run, this is just about what, uh, just about the route that they tried to convey, and then, like, before that, they were going through the, um, uh, Yosemite National Park. Well, that's actually going to be on this route as well. Huh. Uh, you remember the, uh, the Harley-Davidson race from Las Vegas to, uh, Los Angeles? Because if you can remember that race, then you are going to remember portions of this particular race as well. Uh. Oh crap. That was a T-intersection. Oh! I'm looking at those dots on your mini-map, and uh, it seems like they're not reaching that T-intersection anytime soon. No. I mean, it's going to be another three miles to our next checkpoint. We'll find out how far behind they are then. 15 seconds. Oh, or we could find out just there. But yeah, the um, the Rockies are a much younger mountain range than the Appalachian Mountains, hence why they're taller. Although I believe they are not under a fault line anymore either. Like, it would be something like the Himalayas. The Himalayas are definitely immediately underneath a fault, uh, immediately above a fault line. Yeah. 
which is why they are among the tallest mountains in the world, including the tallest mountain in the world. Fault line isn't isn't always like uh, plates going against each other. Like sometimes they're just kind of slipping past each other and just in a uh, in a very long scraping match. Oh yeah, yeah. The fault line in California is one like that uh, slip uh, fault line. And I believe they are at least somewhat responsible for the Sierras. Although, uh, don't quote me on that. I'll try not to. <laughs> Love these mountain roads. But yeah, the reason that Los Angeles and San Francisco are so shaky is because of a slip fault line. Oh yeah. Definitely my kind of road, just... Yeah, and I think we've gotten to the portion that the Harley-Davidson race also used. Oh, yeah. I suppose there's only so many ways across the Sierras, especially when you uh, concentrate them down. Yeah, definitely. Plus, we are actually heading up to Yosemite now. Yeah, you can see the green signs we're passing are saying uh, Yosemite Valley is coming up. Okay. Although it's a bit more than just a valley. And I believe Yosemite is officially the first national park. Although there were other areas that were just sort of set aside by the government to be preserved for uh, visitors to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yosemite was the first national park as such. That was declared as such. Oh. It's a popular uh, vacation destination for both San Francisco and Los Angeles. It's not that far away from either city. What's there to do there? Just hikes? Hiking, camping, bird watching, all the usual outdoor activity stuff. So, the thing that keeps confusing me about camping in the US is what if bears? I'd, I'd be terrified <laughs> just the entire time. What if there's a brown bear just marching up uh, behind a tree? Well, um, they have advice about that. <laughs> okay. For instance, um, all of the food that you have with you should be tied in a sack and then uh, basically suspended from a uh, tree a good 10 feet off the ground uh, because bears are smart enough to identify food packaging and then tear it open oh, great so even if even if it's completely sealed and there's no scent coming out there they go oh hey this uh, if I tear this thing apart I get food let's do that then but yeah, in terms of uh, human attacks, bears usually aren't that uh, eager to harm people. And there's the granite cliffs. Ooh. Bears aren't that usually eager to hurt people or to eat them. Okay. 
but they are eager to find your food and tear into it and eat as much as they can and then run away. So they can cause some property damage if you're not careful about your food storage. Great. And the other thing, of course, is never ever feed a bear because then they will expect that they can get food from humans. Of course. I don't think I'd want a bear as a pet, even if they are adorable. Yeah, they're not adorable forever. And of course, the other thing is that uh, most bears in the United States, the bears with the widest range of where you can find them are the black bear, which are significantly smaller than the brown bear. Yeah. But if you go to a place like Yellowstone or Yosemite, there are brown bears. All right. this view. So, why cover a bridge? That's another thing. I, I, I know that there are covered bridges, and there's one right there. It's not entirely covered. It's, uh, all that lattice work is actually holding the bridge up. Okay. But as for why they put a cover on top of it, I suppose it does help keep some of the environment off of the road surface, thus preserving it a little bit better. Hmm. But in terms of like the wooden covered bridges that you would find out east, those are there purely aesthetically. Huh. Although I suppose, um, you know, back in the old days, the uh, surface that crosses the river would also be wooden. Yeah. And so you would also have that, uh, it would all, it would also have that advantage of preserving it just a little bit from the elements by covering it. But yeah, these days a uh, wooden cover wouldn't do too much to help an asphalt road. Yeah. So the re that's why covered bridges don't really exist anymore, the way they did in those like old timey covered bridges. And right now we are in Sacramento. Oh, nice. We have crossed out of the mountains and into the Central Valley, where Sacramento is at the northern edge of that valley. And it's actually not that far from San Francisco. So as you can see, we are at 94% progression. Nice. So, is Central Valley like the valley? Yeah. When you see a topographical map of California, that giant empty hole in the middle of it, that's Central Valley. <laughs> okay. Like, there are other names for it for different parts of it, but the overall thing is just the Central Valley. Okay. Also, a uh, nice thing about this race is that the last section of it here is on a giant wide interstate with a lot of straightaways. And since that's where the AI tends to fumble, is in the straights, it's sort of nice that the game gives you this chance to make up the distance at the very end if you happen to fall behind. I gotta wonder if this is one of the earlier races that they designed. By the way, another way you can tell that this game is made in Europe is that uh, the the miles counter doesn't switch to yards until it hits one kilometer. <laughs> and here we end on the Golden Gate Bridge. Nice. And just check. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, I was a little out of practice. Two, three, oh. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10, 11. It's over. And a whole ton of icon points. Good night, folks. Bye. So, like I said during the race, I've decided to skip showing the PvP mode and go right to the final video. As such, I'm also skipping the movie I hinted at last time and going straight to the last film, The Cannonball Run. This movie is also about a cross-country race, and it was released in 1981. The Story About the Story The 1973 oil crisis hit the United States particularly hard. Gasoline is relatively cheap here, and cars are ubiquitous, and so a lot of families were hit hard by fuel shortages and by the sudden spike in prices. It forever changed the buying habits of American motorists, and it also caused the government to take drastic steps to improve fuel efficiency. One such step was the National Maximum Speed Law. Motor vehicles tend to get their best gas mileage somewhere between 50 to 60 miles per hour, uh, which is around 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. And so, in 1974, the national government set a maximum speed limit of 55 miles per hour for every highway in the United States. The idea was to encourage better fuel efficiency and safer driving, but the law proved to be ineffective at both tasks, and so it got repealed in 1995. Still, even before 1973, many states were passing restrictive speed limit laws for similar reasons, and drivers weren't happy about them. So, in 1971, an editor of the magazine Car and Driver went on a coast-to-coast -coast drive in a Dodge van as a way to protest and bring attention to these laws. The run and the coverage provided by Car and Driver and other magazines inspired others to follow after him and turn it into a race. This race was illegal, and so the only rules were that you had to start at the same time in New York City, you had to spend the whole time driving one vehicle, and you had to end in Redondo Beach, a coastal suburb of Los Angeles. You could take whatever route you liked, you could drive as fast as you wanted to, but then if the police stopped you and gave you a ticket, then that would slow you down. The race would come to be known as the Cannonball Run, after Ernest Cannonball Baker, a racer who drove across the country in 1927 and made it in 60 hours. The run would be competitively raced four times in 1971, 72, 75, and 79. The film The Cannonball Run was made by Hal Needham and Burt Reynolds. The two originally came together for Smokey and the Bandit, which I've already covered, and The Cannonball Run would be their third project together. The idea was brought to them by Brock Yates, one of the two men who drove the original Cannonball Run, and Yates would also serve as the film's screenwriter. Yates would draw from real events and racing teams to write the script, and both he and Needham drove in the 79 race to get ideas. Production money came from a rather unusual source, Golden Harvest, a major film studio in Hong Kong. For them, the Cannonball Run was part of an effort to expand into the international market, and they made sure that their biggest star, Jackie Chan, would be part of the ensemble cast. It was Chan's first real exposure to most Americans, and when Hal Needham played bloopers during the credits, it inspired Chan to do the same thing when he went on to direct. Then there's all the other recognizable names in the cast. Burt Reynolds' mechanic is Dom DeLuise, and their partnership started in the 70s and would continue throughout the 80s. Their passengers are played by Jack Elam, a character actor who played bad guys in westerns, and Farrah Fawcett, who's one of the original Charlie's Angels. Roger Moore plays a pastiche of James Bond and drives an Aston Martin DB5. Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. dress up like Catholic priests and drive a Ferrari 308 GTS. Jamie Farr, who played Max Klinger on MASH, appears as an Arab sheik driving a Rolls Royce Silver Shadow. Mel Tillis, the country singer, and Terry Bradshaw, the football quarterback, drive a Chevy Malibu, modified for NASCAR. Peter Fonda even shows up for a cameo as the head of a motorcycle gang, just like in Wild Angels. In the movie, Reynolds and DeLuise drive an ambulance, and that ambulance is a modified 1978 Dodge Tradesman. It's the same model and generation that Brock Yates drove during the original Cannonball Run, and both Yates and Needham drove that specific van in the real Cannonball Run held in 1979. According to them, they would have won the race too, but the transmission gave out in the California desert. 
After the filming, Needham gave the van to a church who auctioned it off for charity. Other notable vehicles include a Chevy Monte Carlo, a GMC C35 pickup truck, a Lamborghini Countach LP400S, and a Subaru DL Hatchback. The Cannonball Run was not loved by critics, but at the box office it was a big success that brought in $100 million on a $17 million budget. That would earn it a sequel in 1984, but both Cannonball Run 2 and Smokey and the Bandit 2 are really best avoided. So let's do so, and focus on the first film, as I summarize... The Story the movie begins with two ladies in a Lamborghini spraying an X over a 55 mile per hour speed limit and then evading the police as the credits roll. We then cut to the auto shop of JJ McClure as his mechanic Victor Prinzi hurries in. Victor is late for work because his hamsters had an anxiety attack, but lucky for him JJ is his friend and the two are planning to go on the cannonball run together. But they have a problem. The two planned on driving a heavily modified Porsche, but it got a lot of police attention and they crashed it during a test run while trying to evade a police blockade. After crashing, Victor jumped out in a cape and mask, calling himself Captain Chaos with his sidekick Kato. As Victor and JJ consider what kind of camouflage they should use to evade the police, we see the other teams preparing for the race. Jamie Blake and Morris Fenderbaum plan on disguising themselves as priests. Seymour Goldfarb Jr. is playing at being James Bond and loves fast cars and fake guns. Jackie Chan and Michael Ho are playing themselves, but their characters are the number one racer and computer expert in Japan. And considering that these Hong Kong natives are only in this movie because Golden Harvest bankrolled it, I have to imagine that them pretending to be Japanese is a joke at the American audience's expense. Especially since they speak Cantonese, while the talk show host speaks Japanese. Mel and Terry also play themselves as a couple of good old boys in a NASCAR racing vehicle. Abdul Ben Falafel is a wealthy sheik who wants to win the race in the name of Islam. Bradford Compton is a thrill-seeking CEO. And then there's Pamela Glover, a photographer who loves trees and gets roped into trying to stop the cannonball run by Arthur J. Foyt, a federal regulator on a crusade against loud and wasteful vehicles. The racers collect at the Cannonball Hotel, and Arthur creeps around to listen to them. Specifically, he listens to JJ and Victor, who have decided to race in a fake ambulance, but still need a doctor and a patient to complete their cover in case they get pulled over. They ask a couple ladies to be their patients, but it turns out the two of them are the last team of racers, Marcy Thatcher and Jill Rivers. After that, JJ spots Pamela, nicknames her Beauty, and makes up some BS to hit on her for a while, but then he gets interrupted several times, and so Pamela wanders off. That night, the race organizer, played by Brock Yates himself, explains the rules to the assembled racers, and the teams leave one by one using time cards to track their individual racing times. As they leave, Arthur and Pamela take down their license plates. Victor gets a doctor at the last minute, but it turns out to be a crazy-eyed proctologist named Dr. Nicholas Van Helsing. They still need a patient, though, and so when they come across Arthur and Pamela after Arthur crashes his car trying to follow one of the cannonballers, JJ pulls in Pamela while leaving Arthur on the road. As the racers get going, we start seeing the strategies they use to get out of tickets and jail time. Marcy and Jill use tight jumpsuits and sex appeal to get the highway patrolmen to forgive them. Jackie Chan and Michael Ho turn off their headlights and use infrared scopes to see the road. Seymour uses a CB radio to keep track of police positions, plus his car is full of James Bond gizmos like smoke screens, oil slicks, and an ejection seat. Meanwhile, Pamela isn't sure she wants to go on this long trip with JJ and Victor, so when the New Jersey State Police stop them, the two of them give her a sedative, and Dr. Van Helsing comes up with a completely valid reason why they need to drive to LA instead of fly. Later on, Jamie and Morris stop JJ and Victor in order to bless the patient, but what they really do is distract the drivers so that Morris can puncture their tire. Still, they replace it and stop in St. Louis for gas, and by this point Pamela is on board with the race, and so she heads back to the van after a bathroom break. 
then, when the fake priest stop for gas at the same station, JJ tells some cops that they're actually a couple of disguised flashers. When JJ and Victor hear about a roadblock ahead set up by Foyt, they ask a truck driver with an empty flatbed to smuggle them through under a tarp. Technically, this is against the rules, but the Cannonball Run is really a whatever-you-can-get-away-with kind of race. During the break, Victor works on the transmission, and JJ has a romantic moment with Pamela where he talks about how his dad died before retirement, and so he decided to make the most of his life. That evening, Pamela talks with Victor about his Captain Chaos persona. As the race moves into the desert states, all of the cannonballers end up stuck in one place thanks to road construction. And as they're trading trash talk, a big gang of bikers shows up. They threaten Bradford, the CEO, since he's riding a motorcycle, but then Victor runs in to save him as Captain Chaos. Turns out he's really good at fighting when he's in Captain Chaos mode. And then the other cannonballers join in, and it turns into a big melee. This includes Jackie Chan, who makes a point of having an extended fight scene after everyone else leaves. JJ and Victor pull ahead of the pack when Victor drives in Captain Chaos mode, but as they approach the finish line in Redondo Beach, there's a big pileup and everyone gets out and runs. Captain Chaos is about to win, but when a woman's baby dog is in trouble, he throws aside his time card and runs off to save it. This allows the women team in the Lamborghini to win the race. JJ gets mad at Victor for losing and tears off his mask, but when Victor responds by putting on a new mask and calling himself Captain USA, JJ can't help but laugh. Some hijinks ensue, and I guess they all forgot about the staggered starting times, because JJ and Victor should have won anyway, since they were the last team to leave. But no, the credits roll over some bloopers, and that's the end. The Cars As the last video in this series, I figure it makes sense to focus on the future of car design. Where it's going, what you might see next, and of course, when you'll see that self-driving car. Let's start with the last one first. There's been a lot of talk in the past few years about self-driving technology, about the idea that a car can, without any human intervention, drive from one end of a city to the other, or even one end of the country to the other, safely and reliably. And although that milestone is still some distance away, self-driving features are already showing up in the affordable car market. These features are usually classified as driver assistance. They include things like a forward collision warning that beeps at you if you're about to hit something, a lane assist that beeps at you if you're about to wander out of your lane, and a blind spot indicator that beeps at you if you're about to change lanes when there's a car in your blind spot. But that's just stage one. Stage two is the emergency automatic brake that brings the vehicle to a complete stop before you hit something. The steering wheel that automatically adjusts to put you back into the middle of your lane and the cruise control that slows you down when the traffic ahead slows too. But there's no equivalent for that blind spot warning, and I'll tell you why. It's because car companies want you, the driver, to still be responsible for driving. Let's say that you're a car company and you've developed a self-driving car that's 50% more reliable than the average human driver. The person in the driver's seat could turn around and face the passengers, and your car will get into 50% fewer accidents than if that person were driving. The person in the driver's seat could turn around and face the passengers, and your car will get into 50% fewer accidents than if that person were driving. It would be a great boon to public health, because there would only be 3 million car accidents in the United States per year, and only 1.5 million motor vehicle deaths and injuries but that would not be a boon to the car company that built it. Right now, the responsibility for driving carefully is spread out between all the drivers on the road. Each of them is responsible for the damages they cause through recklessness or carelessness, and they pay for it, either out of pocket or by paying insurance premiums. However, if a car drives itself, then the company that made that car would be responsible for all of the damage it causes. All of those millions of accidents, all that property damage, and all those medical bills, they'd all need to be paid for by one company. Your company. On top of that, there are a lot of drivers out there who are always safe and never get into accidents. Your self-driving car would actually put those drivers in more risk than what they faced out because all of them have the same chance of failure. 
That's why all of the self-driving features out there today, and all of the ones that will come out in the foreseeable future, will come with a caveat. They only work if the driver still has a hand on the steering wheel and is still paying attention to the road. The driver will still ultimately be responsible for the safety of the vehicle, and that won't change unless car companies can create self-driving software that is at least 99% more reliable than the average human driver. Let's see, other stuff. Something we're already seeing in cars today is more task integration. Most new cars can accept voice commands, and the number and sophistication of those commands will go up as time goes on. And while today you can tell your car to make a call or play your music, more advanced models can also find addresses or suggest locations for you. Eventually, navigation systems will be able to understand more general instructions like find a good place to eat or choose the most scenic route. There are some mechanical changes on the horizon too. Alternate fuel vehicles are becoming increasingly popular, with electric cars getting ranges of 100 to 200 miles and recharge times that are down to below an hour. If you ask me, though, I'd say the alternate fuel with some real promise is hydrogen. Hydrogen fuel cells can power a vehicle for just as long as a tank of gas or longer, the only emission it produces is water vapor, and anyone with access to water and an electrolysis machine can make hydrogen. There are a couple of issues, like the net loss of energy from making and burning hydrogen, and the possibility of an explosion, but I think they can be addressed and solved. Toyota already has a hydrogen fuel cell car on the market. As it is, hybrid drivetrains are already showing up in racing vehicles and high-performance luxury models. This is because an electric motor gives you all of its torque the moment you step on the accelerator, while internal combustion engines need to speed up to reach that sweet spot. This can have a big impact on a car's acceleration if you tune the engines right. So, as hybrid systems advance, cars will become both more powerful and more efficient. At this point, even trucks are starting to get in on hybrid technology. The new Ram truck has made a small step forward by replacing its alternator with an electric motor. It doesn't make the truck more efficient, but it does help it tow heavy loads. Ford plans on putting out a true hybrid F-150 in 2020, and they eventually plan to make a full electric truck. And as for flying cars... Well, inventors haven't given up on making one, so someday, maybe. Thanks for joining me again for another LP, and a special thanks to all the patrons who have stuck with me for all this time. I plan on making a few changes to my old dry formula soon, including separate reviews and new video topics. I'll still be playing games and uploading footage on YouTube, though, so watch out for the next game I play, which will be a little something I like to call the truest spiritual successor to System Shock 2. I hope I'll see you there.